Who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? We're going to deal with those about three messages away, but uh, right now let's look at those four horsemen. We have, first of all, we have the white horseman that comes riding with a bow in his hand. Then the red horseman comes and a sword's given to him to conquer. And then the black horse comes and he is the horse of famine, uh, saying a measure of a penny for a measure of wheat for a penny, a measure of barley, and touch not the oil and the wine. And then you have the pale horse that comes riding behind him, and that's the horse reaping death throughout the land. One third, one fourth of the population, and then one third of the population dies, and behind him is hell. The book of Revelation made easy. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are famous in the book of Revelation. I am Michael Pearl, and I'm coming to you from the door, courtesy of No Greater Joy Ministries. We're going to have fun going through the book of Revelation and making it easy for you to understand. Now, the question is asked, how can you take the book of Revelation literally? It's got all these crazy images and symbols in it. Well, we're going to discuss that. We treat it like any other piece of historical literature. We treat it like we would any Homer or any ancient piece of literature that we would read. You use the normal grammatical approach, nothing special, nothing different, just the normal way of interpreting any piece of literature. We recognize that it has similes in it. We recognize it has metaphors in it. We recognize it has analogies in it. We recognize that it has parables in it, and we interpret those accordingly. It's all toward the conveyance of factual history. We know that. It's going to be factual history, even though it uses figures of speech. Now, the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1, says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Notice the word signified. That's the word signified. In other words, he tells us right on the front end that he's using signs in order to convey to us, show us the things. So he's wanting us to understand, to show it, and it's things, that's tangible, which must shortly come to pass. So he's not intending to keep us in the dark with his use of allegorical language. He intends to make us understand what he's saying. You'll see that as we go along. So we recognize the presence of metaphor. Here's the dictionary definition of a metaphor. Metaphor is a figure of speech that for rhetorical effect directly refers to one thing by mentioning another. It may provide clarity or identify hidden similarities between two different ideas. So notice that it provides clarity and identifies hidden similarities. Here is Kelly Elmore, an author, who says, I love how summer just wraps its arms around you like a warm blankie. Now, that's using figures of speech. Summer doesn't have arms. It doesn't wrap its arms around you. But we all understand that clearly when we read it. We know what she's saying. Here's another one. To me, spring is bristling yellow buttercups bending neath the teasing fingers of a warm, caressing wind. That's by Michael Pearl, <laughs> wannabe poet. Now, we know that spring doesn't have fingers. And uh, <laughs> so we understand that's a figure of speech. Now, here's the grammatical context determines the interpretation. The interpretation is found within the words themselves. Take the Bible examples, for instance. This is the most famous passage of Scripture in the Bible other than Judge not that you be not judged. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. I've never been a sheep, and I've never had a shepherd drive me out into a pasture. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. See, that's all figures of speech. No one's ever had trouble understanding it. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, if you take that, what we call literally, then you'd have a whole lot of difficulty. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I've never had Jesus or God prepare food for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. 
My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Are you paranoid? Do you feel like somebody's following you? It's goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now that's <laughs> that entire six verses about the Psalms. That, that entire Psalm is very clearly full of analogy, but it conveys a literal truth about how the Lord is our shepherd and takes care of us. No one has trouble understanding that. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water spring up unto everlasting life. So Jesus said, he's going to give you a well of water and it'll be inside of you and it'll come up and produce everlasting life. Now, was that difficult to understand? I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed. So going back to Isaiah 700 years earlier, we find that this concept of the spirit coming on individuals is compared to drinking water when you're thirsty. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, if you're going to hold the Bible to a standard that you hold no other piece of literature, then you'll say, I've never met a Christian because I've never met anyone that had water coming out of their belly. But this spake he of the Spirit, so it defines what he means by water. It's the Spirit of God, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. So the people hearing what he said about rivers of living water coming out of your belly, they didn't say, he's crazy. They said, this has got to be the prophet. Why? Because it's a fulfillment of those many scriptures where it speaks of the water of life, the Spirit of God, being given to God's people. So his listeners understood it to be a declaration of an offering of the Spirit to Israel. Now, here's a metaphor in Revelation. Now, remember what a metaphor is. It's a figure of speech that for rhetorical effect, directly refers to one thing by mentioning another, it may provide clarity or identify hidden similarities. So a metaphor in the book of Revelation is, and I behold in, law, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as, like a simile, like or as a simile, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So I have a picture there of a, a, a lamb with seven horns, which none have, and certainly don't have seven eyes. What is figurative and what is literal in that passage of Scripture? There are eight elements to identify in that passage. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne. What's the throne? Well, we know throughout the Bible, the throne is where God sits. And the four beasts, we're going to deal with that later. The four beasts are four living creatures that Ezekiel describes, that are described in Zechariah, that are described again in the book of Revelation. They are living creatures with peculiar odd faces and wings and eyes. And in the midst of the elders, now who are the elders? We find out later that they are the redeemed of God around the throne of God. Stood a lamb. Now who is the lamb? We read in the New Testament that Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John said, behold, there is the lamb of God. As it had been slain, a slain lamb, having seven horns, seven eyes, which the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. So this is the picture of what John is seeing. He's seeing the lamb there on the throne, and around the throne are gathered a large congregation of people, and there's the four beasts around the throne, and they're praising God, and they're saying, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou, they're saying this about the Lamb, thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and nation. So that identifies the Lamb as the Lord Jesus Christ, along with many, many other passages. So yes, it's using a metaphor. It's using a figure of speech. 
but it's there to convey a quite literal meaning. Now, let's look at the latter part of that verse. Ha the lamb having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, this, are those literal horns, literal eyes? John, to the seven churches, which in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. So the Bible does speak of seven spirits around the throne of God. And it tells us that they are in the lamps, seven lamps burning. They're, dis, they're, they're spirits created without bodies that do God's service. And out of the throne proceeds lightnings, thunders, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning which before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So it's no longer allegorical when he says, which are the seven spirits of God. We know the lamps burning, the seven lamps represent seven spirits. Now, here's Old Testament confirmation of that. Zechariah 4, I looked and behold a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top bit, seven lamps thereof, seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top. They are the eyes of the Lord. So remember, they had seven horns and seven eyes on the lamp. They're the eyes of the Lord. These lamps burning are eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So to misunderstand a metaphor which has significant backing in multiple parallel passages is to confess uncommon ignorance or to reveal one's bias and insincerity or to profess antagonistic unbelief or it's to dismiss literary convention or, or it's to be the dumbest one in the room. <laughs> you know, believers don't have any trouble with the book of Revelation. I understand if, you're not, if you haven't read much of it that uh, it, it would be troubling to you to try to figure out what's what it just takes a little time reading it. Now, here's another metaphor in Revelation. <clears throat> Who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? We're going to deal with those about three messages away, but uh, right now let's look at those four horsemen. We have, first of all, we have the white horseman that comes riding with a bow in his hand. Then the red horseman comes and a sword's given to him to conquer. And then the black horse comes and he is the horse of famine. Uh, saying a measure of a penny for a measure of wheat for a penny, a measure of barley, and touch not the oil and the wine. And then you have the pale horse that comes riding behind him, and that's the horse reaping death throughout the land. One third, one fourth of the population, and then one third of the population dies, and behind him is hell. That's your four horsemen. Now, the question is are these literal horsemen, or are they a figure of something? They're literal horsemen, literal personalities, literally carrying a bow. We're going to see that. Zechariah 1, 8, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He stood among the myrtle trees, and there in the bottom and behind him were red horses, speckled and white. And I said, O Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. So this angel is showing him interpreting the meaning of those colored horses. These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. You remember the eyes of the Lord going to and fro through the earth? And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. So these were emissaries of God riding up on these horses, just as when Jesus comes back, he'll be riding up on a white horse. Zechariah 6 again. In the first chariot were red horses. Second chariot, black horses. Notice the colors. Third chariot, white horses. And in the fourth chariot, grizzly and bay, which would be a pale horse. So the exact same four-color horseman right there in Zechariah. And I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? So now we're going to get an angelic interpretation as to what these four colored horses, exactly the ones in Revelation, are. The angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The black horse, which are therein, go forth unto the north country. That would be up into the Russian area. The white horse go after them. So the black horse would be the horse of famine. The white horse would be the horse of conquering in a different order here 
because famine happens first in the north country and then the conquering takes place and the grizzly go forth toward the south country and that's the horse of death. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me saying, behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit. If you look that up in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, quieted his spirit means that God has served judgment. And he's now resting from his judgment. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, behold, a white horse. And see, he that settled him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So the first thing that's going to happen in the tribulation, and we have the chart of it right here. The first thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a white horse from God, an emissary from God is going to come down and provoke the nations of the earth, the Antichrist in particular, to begin to conquer other nations in a very rapid way. And we're told that he is very effective in making war. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see, and there went out a red horse, and powers given to him that sent their own to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. Now that's not the, just the armies, that's people killing one another in the streets and so forth. And there was given unto him a great sword. So there's our second horse rider going forth, stimulating the people of the earth to become violent. Right now, our government is helping out the red horse. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. See, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. His name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over a fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of earth. That, that doesn't mean he kills a fourth of the earth's population at that point, I don't think. It means he's over one-fourth of the population area of the earth. And in that area, uh, that's his jurisdiction. He's not outside of that. Uh, he begins to kill with sword and, and hunger. You saw it here. And with death, that's diseases. And with the beast of the earth. So actually the beast are going to rise up. We'll deal with that more later. So that's the four horsemen. And they are literally heaven's recon soldiers. They're the front line messengers who provoke the nations of the earth into war. If you go back in the Old Testament, you'll read God doing that. You'll read him going out, an angel being sent out to provoke a king to go out to battle in order to get him killed. And so that's nothing new. And knowing the whole Bible, this is easy to understand. It's only difficult to understand if you're not a Bible student, not a Bible reader. If you've just read it through three or four times, uh, you would understand this. You would get a picture of this in your mind. So I'm going to help you if you haven't had time to read it through three or four times. I'm going to help you, and we're going to go all the way through it, and you're going to see it very clearly. Okay, until next time, signing out. Get your own print of Mike's Revelation painting at ngj.org revelation. Available as a poster or a full-size banner and includes a copy of Mike's Revelation Handbook Study Guide. 